Hi, my name is Matt Bobke, and welcome to the Lightning Demo segment of the PowerShell and DevOps Global Summit 2021. While the summit feels a little different this year, the leadership team at the DevOps Collective has done an outstanding job bringing the community together for this event. You're about to watch some very clever and insightful bite-sized presentations about a wide variety of topics. Don't be fooled though, there's a ton of information that's about to come your way. Let's get started. Hey everybody, welcome to PowerShell Summit. This is going to be a lightning demo of the Starship prompt and how you can use it with PowerShell. I'll be showing you what Starship is, how to get up and running with it, and how to do some basic customization, and then you can take it from there as you like. So what is Starship? Well, Starship is a very broadly compatible across all kinds of shells, very fast, powered by Rust, and very customizable uh, prompt that you can use to customize what your PowerShell prompt looks like and get more contextual information and operations around how that works. So what does that mean? Well, let's kind of go through sort of a quick demo of what that looks like. So here we see a typical prompt. You notice if you do something like false, that it shows that the last item was an error. Going true brings it back to normal. If you uh, change to a directory with git in it, you can see that it will show you the current git branch. Very contextual, nice things is that it doesn't show you information that you don't need to know if it's not relevant to where you're at. See here, adding a cargo file will show you the cargo version. It can show you .NET versions and all kinds of things like that. If you do a git add, you can see it can give you your current git status with the question mark and the plus. After you commit, you can see that goes away. And now I'll do an example of sudo. So you switch to a different user. The prompt can automatically show you, hey, now we're in root, just to remind you that you're doing things that could be dangerous. You can hop right back out. And then the configuration is very customizable. So if we go to open sort of the default Starship Toml, you can see that you know the default symbol for like the Rust language has that R, but we can go in and we can uh, customize it. And now you can see that crab changes to an R. So that just gives you a real that's a real quick demo um, that gives you an idea of like what the kind of prompt looks like, but it's very very customizable. Lots of themes available to really kind of dial it in how you want it and whatever kind of look you want to have. All right, so let's uh, go ahead and get this installed. We'll start by going to starship.rs, which is the website for the product. And this is a free open source uh, project. So, you know, there's nothing to buy or anything. Just go ahead and click get started. And you can kind of see here, you have a little more information. And then what we're gonna go ahead and do is we're gonna go ahead and head over here to installation. And then uh, first thing we need to do is get a nerd font. A nerd font is a type of font that has all kinds of extra ligatures that give us a sort of view. If we go here to nerdfonts.com, you can get an idea of sort of more information about what that is. So it's basically just a font with a bunch of built-in extra stuff, which is always really nice um, for what we want to do with this. Okay, so we know that we need to get that. And then the next step that we need to do is simply installing it. And uh, they recommend installation with a tool called Scoop. We'll show what that looks like here. First thing you do is fetch this, uh, excuse me, the Scoop tool, which lets you just go ahead and download and install that tool. And the Scoop allows you to just sort of install programs locally on your computer without needing admin rights or anything like that. It's a real handy kind of tool. If you use like NPM with Node, it's uh, very similar. So we'll first find our buckets. We'll add that nerd font bucket and we'll go ahead and add a nerd font. My favorite is a Delusia nerd font, which is a modification of the Cascadia code font that comes with Windows Terminal. Uh, and that's the font that you see here being typed with. So uh, that one works pretty well for me. Then I'm also going to install Starship, which is scoop install Starship. All right, so now we got it installed and now we just need to enable it for PowerShell so that we can now see our new Starship prompt. Uh, the information is here on the website. Basically, you just need to add a line to your profile. So I'm just going to open my profile here in Visual Studio Code. That's going to come up here. And then I am just going to go ahead and add in that line and then save my profile. And now I'm going to come back here. I'm going to go ahead and just type PWSH to get a fresh new shell. And there you go. I have that new Starship prompt. You notice it's very kind of nice and thin. Kind of go into a particular folder. You can see that detail. 
go into a folder that has a Git repository and you can see the branch as well as the Git status on that repository, which is great. So now let's look at a few ways you can customize the Starship prompt. Uh, the Starship prompt is controlled by a TOML file, which if you're not familiar with is very similar to uh, uh, JSON and YAML, except it uses kind of a more like INI style format. So if you know the old INI files, it's kind of much easier to read that way, but it's actually a very well-structured uh, configuration format. In your folder, your .config folder, you'll create a file called starship.toml and it'll reside there, excuse me, reside there. Uh, on the left side here, you see I have a VS code with that file open and some commented out configurations I'm gonna show you. And on the right side, I have my prompt. So you see it kind of has the default format here. I can go to documents, I can go to projects, and I can go to you know a project with uh, a Git repository and you can see all that working as expected. I can go to the, for instance, the PowerShell repository and see what .NET framework I currently am working with in there. So that all works great. That's the defaults. If you don't want anything more than that, you don't have to, but here's some kind of neat stuff you could do. One thing I like to do is I like to use these directory substitutions so that for certain very common folders that I access, I get these nice icons or emojis to remind me where I'm at. So as soon as I apply that, and every time you save a change, it happens immediately. So you see now I have, oh, I have this nice home here. If I go to my projects, okay, now projects is my root. And if I want to go to my documents, okay, now I have my documents as my root. And so I get this very nice cleaner navigation without having a whole bunch of wall of text over here. All right, let's try customizing the format a bit. Uh, with my directories, uh, my directory format line here, I like to add a little bit of extra style here. I like to change the colors. And I like to use these power line font indicators to kind of put a nice little background to it. So let me go ahead and turn save that. And now I have this nice little background to my uh, to this line. And if I can do it at home right, there we go. So I can still browse down into these folders and get the same result, but I have this kind of nice little view and a little bit easier to read, a little bit easier to see. Uh, what about for like errors? Well, maybe I want just a couple different characters. So say if I'm putting in a, uh, a mistake in a character, uh, in real time, you can see here is that it knows through PS read line if my line is incorrect. So if I try to do a line that's not an actual line, it turns red, uh, but it, then it turns back when it knows that I have an actual good line. So I'm, oh, this and forgot my quote. There we go. Now I got my quote. Great. Uh, and if something goes wrong, you get this nice little boom line to let me know that uh, there was an error with my previous line. So that gives you kind of a quick idea of some of the configuration changes you can make. If you want to learn even more customizations, the Starship RS has a nice big configuration button up here and gives you all kinds of information about uh, how to configure the file, how to get information, how to get some logging out of it, do all kinds of formatting and timing, and then all the different categories of things you can customize. So for instance, we can look at the timestamp and do all kinds of customizations there. You can do things for things like uh, the host name of the system and your Git state. And so you can look at all these modules and then there's also information for making additional custom commands. You can take any command that you can get an output from and have that added to your terminal contextually if you want. So that is a quick overview of the Starship prompt and hopefully you find this useful and can use it to customize. And I can't wait to see some of the uh, cool prompts that you guys put together. Thanks and have a great PowerShell Summit. Hello, I'm Dave Carroll. And this Summit 2021 Lightning Talk is entitled Converting a PS custom object to a class definition. In response to an Iron Scripter challenge, I wrote a script module which does just that, and it can be used as a starting point for most classes. When dealing with APIs and other sources of data, the returned objects may not adhere to the PowerShell best practice of using Pascal case for property names. Additionally, there often will be multiple types of returned objects, some of which can be nested in other objects. While you can use a custom format for the select object command, a more elegant method would be to use a custom PowerShell class. Let's see how this module can help. First, we need to import the module. Next, we need to create a sample data set. 
Often the API will return JSON objects similar to the following person object. You can see there is an asset object for the person's vehicle. The invoke rest method automatically converts the response JSON to a PS custom object. Let's see what that looks like for our person object. We can examine the property tabs using get member. From this output, we can see that birth date, first name, and last name are lowercase and have an underscore separating the words. This is called snake case. Also, the birth date is a string instead of a date-time object, and the hobbies are an array of generic objects. Now that we understand the returned object, we will now use the convert to class definition command to create a new class definition. I'm setting the class name and I'm telling the command that I want three methods. One to get the profile display text another to get the age, and the last one to override the toString inherited method. The out current file is part of the PowerShell editor services for VS Code. It also adds the here string grouping. I'm just going to clean this up a bit. You can see that the methods are just placeholders. I have some code that I've already written that I will replace what we have here. Also, I have a couple more properties that I want to add, which were not part of the original data set. I need to add them to the constructor. This property list isn't sorted as I want, so I'm going to replace those and include the new full name and age properties. Lastly, I'm going to override the toString method for the person vehicle class. I'm doing this so when a person vehicle object is nested in the person object, it will be represented as something meaningful instead of the default of the type name. Now that we have the class definition properly tweaked, we need to dot source it. And now we can simply create a person object by using the type accelerator. Let's check out the new object. You can see that all property names are Pascal case, and birth date appears to be a daytime object. We can also see that the toString method is used for the person vehicle object. Now let's see what the toString method returns. And now the get profile method. If you recall, the two strings simply calls the get profile method. Now let's look at the object's members. You can see that birth date is indeed daytime type. The hobbies properties is an array of strings, and we see the person's vehicle. You can also see the two additional methods. And that's it for this lightning talk. If you're interested in using this module, it's available as a GitHub gist at the following link. The articles link will take you to the three articles on my blog that goes in depth and how I wrote the module. Lastly, I highly recommend checking out the Iron Scripter site for PowerShell challenges for various experience levels. Thank you for your time and hope that you enjoy the rest of Summit. Hi everyone, thank you for watching my lightning demo about Azure Pipeline extensions. In this demonstration, we will show you how to create an Azure Pipeline extension within 10 minutes. But first, let me introduce myself. My name is Mike van der Graag, 
and I'm currently the CTO of 350, a consultancy company in the Netherlands. I'm also a Microsoft Certified Trainer and the founder of the Dutch Cloud Meetup that organizes cloud-related meetups in the Netherlands. To get started building Azure Pipeline extensions, you need the following tooling available on your laptop. So please make sure that you have these toolings installed. So let's get started. The first step is to scaffold the directory and make sure that we have all files in place that we need for the extension. We can do this via the TFX CLI by running the command TFX build task create. We give this a task name, a friendly name, a description, and basically the author that is creating the extension. If you press enter, the files for the extension will be created and be placed in the specified directory. So if you go to the extensions folder, we can see the, the files created for this extension. To be able to talk to Azure DevOps for the input variables, we need a specified PowerShell module in our extension. So let's move back to the terminal and install it by using the save module command that makes sure that the PowerShell module is specified, specifically saved in a folder we supply. So we supply it in a ps underscore module subfolder of our extension. We install this module and after this module is installed, the only thing we need to do is remove the version folder that's also saved with this extension. So you, have, you see that you have a version folder. So let's select everything that's in the modules folder. Just drag it up folder on top of it to make sure that we can remove the version folder. Let's also move this folder and place this one in here and then remove the version folder. This make this makes sure that we can use the VSS task SDK module in our extension and run it within our pipeline. Next step is to alter the task.json file of the extension. The task.json file contains all the information about the extension that's required for Azure DevOps to know how it works and what input it requires. You can also see the friendly name, name and description here again and also see that you have different inputs. So we will remove the sample inputs and replace it by other inputs. So we will have a file path input, we have a variable name input and add new lines input. And you can also see that we have different types here available. So we have a file path, we have a type string and we have a type boolean. Next to that, we will also change the execution. So we will remove the node execution and we will keep the PowerShell tree execution. And that's basically targeting the sample.ps1 PowerShell script file. As you may already know, Azure Pipeline extensions are just a script that is executed on an agent. So as you can see here in this script I've, I've prepared for this demo, which we will copy over to the sample.ps1 file, we have some predefined things that's really important for the agent. So we have the trace VSTS entering invocation method that will make sure that everything is logged to the agent and it's being used and also being logged uh, to the screen as well. We have the get VSTS input and that will basically get the input from the task. So basically the task, the inputs that we have specified in task.json are retrieved via this comment. So we will be retrieving the file path, the variable name and the add new lines. The rest of the script is basically a sample script I just used for this demonstration and that reads out the, the content of the specified file and places the content of that file in a predefined variable that you basically name in the variable name. And that's basically done by this comment. Then it just ends the invocation of the task and continues the execution of the other pipeline tasks. To be able to package an extension, you require a file called vss-extension.json. Basically, this file contains all the information about the extension and all the information that is required for the marketplace to work. So as you can see here, 
I have some information about the extension. So I have a specified ID. That's a unique value. I have a specified publisher, and that will be basically the publisher in the marketplace. And I have some links in here as well. Basically, these links will be displayed on the marketplace on the item. So I will have a link for issues so that people can report issues if they want. And for example, also how they need to get started with the extension. Another thing that's also important is basically the content as well. So maybe if you build an extension, you have a specif specified license for that extension. So you can specify that with the license.txt file, but you can also have uh, details about the extension itself. And that's basically specified in the readme.md file. Basically the, the content of the readme.md file is placed on top of the marketplace item um, if you search for the item in the marketplace. What I will be doing now as well is we create the additional files mentioned in the v6 extension file to be sure that we can package the extension. So also a readme.md. As you may have noticed in this file, we also have an icon. So I will also copy my icon in the extension folder and also update the default icon with my own icon so that we make sure that the extension looks good. And I also clean up the sample.json because we don't need it anymore in this extension. With the VSS extension file in place, we can package up our extension so that we will be able to install the extension itself. So for this again, we need the TFX CLI and we do TFX extension create. This will package up our extension to a V6 file. So you, we will see the file appearing in our interface as well. And we will be able to move that to the marketplace. So let's also open up the marketplace. And basically you can find the marketplace at marketplace.visualstudio.com. And if you log in, you can you have options to publish extensions. So if we go to the publish extensions option, we will go to the publisher I already have. And we will be able to upload an extension. So if we just wait for this to finish up, we can click on top on the new extension. We can choose Azure DevOps because we are building an Azure DevOps extension and we can drag in the extension itself. So I have it already here. Let me drag it in. The interface will verify the extension. Normally this will take up about 10 seconds. And if it's verified, you can see that it's verified. And you can also see that's a private extension and not shared. Private extensions are not shared by default, so you have to share them with a specified organization. So I will be sharing this extension with MSFT playground minus demo that's basically my demo organization and if it's shared i can close this window i can choose view extension to go to the extension in the marketplace and i can click on the get free button because i'm already signed in with a user that's known in the organization for the msft playground demo i can directly install it from here into that organization. So it will try to load up the organization. I can click on install and it will install the extension on the organization. So if we then move to the organization, so I'm now in MCFT playground demo, I choose one of my projects and in the project, just go to the pipeline section. And I think I already have a pipeline available in here. So I will choose this pipeline. I will do edit and interface. I will just look for the extension to see if it's available. So if we search here for content, because that's part of the name, we see that we have an extension here available called content to variable with the specified input values that we have specified in the JSON, JSON file, task.json. So in the last 10 minutes, I've shown you quickly how to create an Azure DevOps extension. I hope you guys enjoyed it. And if you want to get in contact, just choose one of the options on this slide. Thank you again. Bye.
Hello everyone, welcome to our session, monitoring your PowerShell scripts with Azure Log Analytics. My name is Paul Ogian. I'm a solutions architect for Micron. And this is the abstract, but let's go directly to the demo. So let's go to Visual Studio Code. So the requirements for this demo, you need the PS framework module installed and also you need to have a Azure Log Analytics workspace. Uh, my script in this case is called demo. And we need to set up the workspace ID and the share key of the Azure Log Analytics. So where you get those values are here in the portal. So go to the Log Analytics workspace. And then you need to click on Agents Management. So here you can see the workspace ID and the primary key. So those values are here. And then this commandlet will uh, set up the login provider for Azure Log Analytics. And the other thing I do is I turn off the file system one. So by default logs to the file system, but in this case, we don't need it. So let's run all these commands all together. Okay, the next thing is to log in the start message and the end message. For that, I use this commandlet called the write ps message. So that's at the start of my script. And then at the end of my script, I you know, print the uh, end message. And if there is an error, I'll just you know, print an error. So let's do the, the first commandlet here. So I'll just start it and you know, the first time that you uh, start a message, it will automatically create the table for you. So you go to logs and then look on custom logs and you will see oops, the table PS logs CL. So that command it automatically create a table and all these columns and also fill all the values that are needed. So we can take a look and we can run it. Uh, let's minimize this to visualize it better. So here, uh, as you remember on the script, I always have at the, at the start, you know, the start message and then an end message with a timestamp. So I know when it starts, when it ends and the errors, you know, if there's an error, we're pin errors and, you know, and all these values are automatically provided by that commandlet. So you don't have to do anything else. So let's back to the script. And then the body of the script is very simple. I'm just simulating some activities. So I just get a random number. So I make it wait for those amount of seconds. And if the wait is divisible by three, I just generate a random error. Um, so let's write the end message to you know, finish the script. And then since I'm on a Mac, um, I schedule it using a, you know, a shell script and a cron tap. So it's running every minute to you know, simulate some activity and that's it. So this is very simple with a PS framework, we can uh, uh, send the data to log analytics. So now all we need to do is analyze the data. So go back to our uh, log analytics workspace. So I already have the query safe. So in this, the, in this case, the first thing we need to find out is the duration of my scripts. So I have a duration query. Uh, we need to find all the start messages. So if I run this, so this is like the custom language, which is similar to SQL to you know query the log analytics workspace. So in this case, I find all the start times. Now I need to find all the end times, which are here. And then I, you know, you can see start end times, and then I need to join the start with the end times using the run space ID. So every time you run a script, you get a unique run space ID, which is like a unique or primary key. So I can join it, and then I can find the difference between the end time and the start time 
which is the duration. Um, so I can join it here and find the duration. So the duration is over here, it says Neo 13, 3, 6, and you know, the rest of the data is over here. Uh, the other thing I do is I summarize it and I create buckets of two minutes, which are over here. If I run the entire query, it look like this. And if I minimize this, so you can see it better, you know, 30 seconds, 4, 12, 10 seconds. And then you can create a chart also. Click on chart. And you can see you know, it's almost you know, evenly distributed you know, around you know, 10 seconds. But then all of a sudden, there is one big one which is a 30 second duration. And then we can pin it to a dashboard over here so we can visualize it better. But we will go to the dashboard on the next query. So now that we can see the duration, now we need to find the anomalies. So I have anomaly query, which is very similar to the one we use for the duration. In fact, uh, we can uh, run all this. And then we have the duration, you know, all the rows here. But then we need to transform all those rows into a time series. And the time series data type is like a column with all those values. So now I get a single row with all those values, like an array, which is, which are the, you know, the time series. And then I pass it to the series decompose anomalies function that will find the anomaly programmatically instead of just looking at the chart and it will give you anomaly score. So if I run this, I need to select it. So we give you an anomaly score and you know, I can minimize this and also create a chart. So now remember the previous chart, I had a duration and then I have you know, one that uh, run it for 35 seconds. So it gives me a score. So the bigger the score, the bigger the anomaly. So 21 is the score. So now I can programmatically find the anomaly. And also I can pin this to a dashboard and you know visualize it better. So if I go to the dashboard right now, so I click OK. Uh, click on dashboard. So now you can see it, you know, let's do a refresh. So you can visualize the duration and the anomaly. So this is the duration, you know, the 35 seconds and then the anomaly score. So now programmatically we can find what is the anomaly. Uh, the other query I want to show is the errors. So I also have the query saved. So I go to my save queries. And uh, this is the error query. So I'm just looking for the messages, you know, with this custo language um, that have error on it. And then minimize this. So I have all the errors. There are 49 records in this case. And I'm only changing the numbers, you know, 12, 9, 3. So it's the same text. But if I want to find the pattern, in this case, it's easy. You know, we know what the pattern is, but uh, I'm using the reduce. Uh, custo function or command. Uh, oh, I need to select the entire query. So here, instead of giving me 49 rows, it just give me the, the pattern. In this case, it's an asterisk here. And we can also pin this to a dashboard. And if we go to the dashboard, that's what you see over here. So you get all the errors, but instead of looking at the errors, you can also look at the pattern that is you new know, 49 and the asterisk, which is the number that varies. And that's all we have. Uh, let's go back to our PowerPoint. And to summarize, that's what we have learned today. And this is my contact information if you have any questions. So I hope you like uh, this presentation. Uh, thanks, bye. Hi, I'm James Brundage with Start Automating, and today we're going to talk through smart aliasing for dummies. Before that, a little bit of a brief introduction. Again, I'm James with Start Automating. 
I've been a PowerShell consultant for about 11 years now. Before that, I was on the PowerShell team for a few years, so that brings me up to about 15 years of PowerShell total. I do love PowerShell, especially I love making useful and interesting tools and toys. Uh, and I like finding ways to bend and break rules, finding new tricks and techniques. Today we're going to talk about one of my favorites, smart aliasing. What is smart aliasing? Well, it's a way to kind of break the language. For more about these sort of techniques, uh, check out the Game Breaking PowerShell talk. But for now, let's just go through what you can do with PowerShell names. See, PowerShell is a very flexible language, much more flexible than most people think it is. Commands can be named about anything you'd like, and I do mean almost anything. These are all technically legal command names. URLs, sure. You can have brackets in them too, if you want to denote a parameter. You can have a regular expression group as a command name. Totally legal, totally valid. You can have something as simple as a sequence of characters, like dot .at. Not all characters, we'll get to that in a second. But you can also have simple keywords. On is a great example of, you know, a language keyword that you can effectively add with this sort of technique. What's not legal? Well, I mean, these things are kind of possible, but not really invocable curly braces and parentheses you can't really easily declare you you can if you use the function provider and use curly brace syntax but it will get very unreadable very quickly and it will never be easy to invoke and punctuation used in operators kind of falls under the same category it might be kind of possible to twist PowerShell's arm to declare a function like minus minus something but you're never going to be able to run it interactively something minus minus fair game. But this opens up all sorts of interesting worlds in PowerShell. This opens up any kind of syntax that you can possibly imagine and you can do it with a very simple technique. Smart aliasing. What is smart aliasing? It's when you take multiple aliases and map them to one command. Then you use the name of the caller to change the functionality. So instead of just having a bunch of different shortcuts for one command, what name it's called with changes how it runs. Brief note here, please turn off script analyzers autocorrect for this, or otherwise it will mess up your day. Now, my invocation, invocation name will contain the name used to call the command under at least most circumstances. If it's not there, you can go ahead and use my invocation line. And you can parse out where you start. And that'll actually tell you one way or the other how you were called. The first will work for almost all command cases that don't explicitly use the operator. The second will you work when the call operator is used or when you're actually embedding a variable and aliasing sort of to that. Um, you can also use dynamic parameters for much more dynamic functionality. Uh, I'm not going to kind of show this example in the lighting round, but I will in the longer talk. And again, this opens up whole new interesting worlds in PowerShell. This technique is really great for rapidly importing a lot of functionality without write, rewriting a lot of code. And to kind of give a small taste, we're going to go take a very simple class in C Sharp and we're going to expose it to PowerShell in one function. I give you invoke math. Invoke math is a nice simple example of smart aliasing, about as quick as I can make one. And basically it allows you to use static methods and properties from the math class. Here's how it works. We've got a argument list parameter that will be the first one positionally and will take any remaining arguments. We have a method name parameter. This is in case we want to use it like a normal PowerShell command. And then here's the little tiny bit of code required for smart aliasing. I check my invocation name. If it's not my command name, then I know I'm being called with an alias, and I can go ahead and figure out what that is. I'm actually allowing for any non-word characters to be stripped out. I'm also allowing for it to start with math dot. But 
for the moment we'll just run through a really simple example. If I don't end up finding a method match at this point, I complain, therefore this makes that uh, kind of pseudo-mandatory parameter. If it's not a method of math, I complain again. And then I just check to see if it's a method, invoke it if it is, and otherwise emit the property. Real simple bit of code. So I'm going to go ahead and set a few aliases to this. Run this file. And I can go ahead and say pi, or e, or abs. Oh, I didn't provide it a value. Let's go ahead and give it one. There's one. Absolute value of negative 10, 10, same thing. Good deal. Now, the last little line here is actually taking everything in the math class, getting its static members, and setting those aliases to invoke math. And this allows me to do something like map pow 2 to 16, which, you know, that looks vaguely familiar. I think that happens to be uh, 64 kilobytes. What do you know it is? Uh, I can also go ahead and say tangent of 0.5, for instance, uh, sine of 0.3. You get the point. So there's smart aliasing in action. There's a really simple example of it, and hopefully that helps you understand how it all works. Like this idea? Want to learn more? Got any questions? Get in contact. You can sometimes find me on Twitter, uh, at James Brew. I am generally on the PowerShell Discord at Start Automating, and you can also use the old school email, james.brundage at start-automating.com. Thank you very much, and have a good day. Hey, it's Robert. I'm going to take you through Get Her Done from MD Cluster to GitOps in a few minutes. And as the title says, I only have a few minutes, so I'm going to be talking pretty quickly. Uh, what we're going to do here is we're going to create a new Kubernetes cluster using Kind and then bootstrap Flux onto it and then have GitOps, uh, basically. So uh, before I uh, started the video, I uh, created a couple of environment variables, uh, the GitHub user and GitHub token. I don't want to be playing with tokens on camera, so I just did it before uh, we started recording. But uh, let me get my cluster created. So um, what how Flux works is it, it deploys a couple of, uh, of a couple of controllers into your cluster. Um, I stole in some pictures from the Flux uh, documentation that they already done it, so why not? Um, first of all, we're going to have the source controller, and the source controller is going to look and talk to the Kubernetes API and take a look at the uh, custom resource definitions, uh, Git repository, Helm repository, or bucket, which is the sources that you can have. Um, and then it's going to monitor that source. Um, in our case, it's going to be a GitHub uh, re a repo, repo. So we're going to, uh, our source controller is going to get that from Git repository and then look into our GitHub repo and see if there's any changes. If there is any changes, it's going to create an artifact which the so called consumers are going to use. Uh, one of them are the customized controller. Customized control is what you'll use to deploy. Well, regular Kubernetes YAML or customize uh, Kubernetes YAMLs into your cluster. Uh, so if you put in a YAML file that has a deployment in it, the customized controller is the one that's going to deploy it into your cluster. We also have a Helm controller. I'm not going to look at that at all now because you know we're this is a short demo. Uh, but it takes if you put in if you put in something that uses Helm, this is what's going to create those Helm releases and and all that, that kind of jazz. We also, well, since we have a couple of seconds more, we also have a notification controller, which obviously is a, a necessary thing in, in this case because things are going to happen in your cluster and you need to get notified of the changes. So you can have uh, changes in source or uh, certain uh, events on the different contro controllers uh, you know, piped into your either Teams or Slack or even Discord. Um, looks like most of the 
most of the, the kind cluster result. So Flux has a CLI tool. We're going to use that. Uh, in this case, we're going to bootstrap GitHub, like I said. Um, we're going to work with our repository called Flux demo, which is under my user. Uh, this can also be an organization, obviously. We're going to work in the main branch. Uh, in this case, my repository is private. So that's why it's set to private. Also, uh, we're going to work under the path cluster demo, so you can have several clusters inside of your Git repository. Uh, let me just start bootstrapping. Uh, so what this does, obviously, it gets the manifests. It's uh, it, it'll deploy that out. Um, as you can see, there's, this is just normal Kubernetes deployment. So it takes the source controllers and makes sure that uh, they are out. It set up network policies, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. As soon as that is done, we're gonna pull down our uh, our repository again and take a look at that. Oh yeah, also it says configure and deploy key. It's gonna actually uh, put in an SSH key for it to work. So it, it'll have an SSH key to, to work with your cluster. Um, bootstrap's finished, all right. We're gonna take a, do a git poll. And if we look here, we have now our folder called clusters uh, demo, and we only have the flux system uh, namespace with different uh, components. So uh, right now, this is basically Flux. So this is Flux itself. So you can go into these and do changes based on how, let's say you want them to pull down the source more often than default, you can go in here and change it. Um, yeah, so I have already one very simple deployment YAML file. It's more or less straight out of the uh, Kubernetes documentation. <laughs> Uh, it's going to deploy an, an Nginx image, normal stuff, nothing weird. But instead of applying it manually, we're going to put it into a Git repository and then, you know, everything's going to go from there. So let's just, uh, let's go back to our file here. I'm going to copy it into the cluster. So now we have our Nginx folder here and our deployment.yaml. I'll do get that and and push it out and if we look at deploy here what you're going to see is when when as soon as flux is uh you know it, it's on the sync uh, uh, time interval as soon as it's going to see the change it's going to start the deployment and um, if we're lucky this won't take that long because i'm on strict time we're on a month of five minutes so a couple minutes left So I'll just edit this out, I guess. Yeah, or there we go. So we got our deployment. Uh, if we take a look at the pods, we are now we now have our container created. So that's it. That's how long it actually takes to get GitOps uh, set up. Uh, obviously, there is a lot more, but uh, the kind folks over at WeWorks that create Flux have made it pretty easy to bootstrap a cluster in a couple of minutes. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Glenn Saiti and I've talked about testing with PowerShell many times now. Firstly about unit testing and then acceptance testing with Pesta. I've had many great chats with people about testing and how it's helped them with their job and make them a better PowerShell scripter. And a common refrain I hear from people is like, testing is hard, or it takes a long time to learn, or my all-time favorite, testing is something developers do. Which is really weird, because in some companies, the software developers aren't even doing the testing, that's what the QA people do. So it raises the question, what is a software tester? And a really quick way to find out what people do is to look at your local job websites or LinkedIn job postings and see what they say. So a quick search later, and I found these types of requirements. Designing automated test suites, 60% automation testing, 40% manual. Contribute towards maintaining regression suites, review and analyze system specifications, regression testing and reporting, ability to write clear and concise test bug reports. They make software testing sound like a really boring job, where you just find stuff that's broken, report it, and then find something else that's broken, and so on. And much of it's manual, not even automated testing. And of course, we get the ridiculous requirements as well. 
Uh, you will create and run the test cases, both manual and automated. Like, don't we have computers to run automated tests? Why am I doing that? We need you to help ensure our testing and QA processes keep pace with our ambitious development roadmap. So testing and quality assurance is an afterthought to development then. And that's a bad sign. And we move fast and we break things, starting with convention. Like, what on earth does that have to do with software testing? It's no wonder that many people have trouble applying software testing to PowerShell when this is what people think a software tester does. Boring, repetitive tasks to find bugs. So I feel that these job requirements mostly miss the point. If you've ever met a good software tester, you'll know there's much more to them. Good software testers apply a different mindset to their work. A testing mindset. And I think there are three aspects to having a testing mindset. Creative thinking, problem solving, and exploration and experimentation. A good tester doesn't blindly go through a checklist because writing tests is actually a trivial task. We can almost get computers to do that for us automatically. But designing tests that are useful and then add value to your PowerShell is not a trivial process. It requires you to consider many factors before you even write a single line of pester code. How is this PowerShell supposed to be used? Who would use this? What could go wrong? What could go right? What's the chance that someone would do something out of the ordinary? You're assessing the risk and the impact of the PowerShell and deciding if it's worth writing a test for that scenario. And this judgment call requires you to think creatively and consider options that are not immediately obvious. And over time, you get better and faster at thinking about PowerShell and how best to test it or not test it. Many of those job descriptions mention run tests, do this, do that, follow the bouncing ball. And even if you use creative thinking to make great tests, they make it sound like a button pushing exercise. But a good tester knows how to problem solve, how to take those great creative tests and apply them at the right time. They see test failures as a learning opportunity, not something that's broken. And a typical example of this is creating error reports or raising a GitHub issue. Just reporting an error happened isn't enough. A testing mindset wants to probe deeper. There are so many variables and things that can cause an error to occur. And a testing mindset looks at the failed test and tries things to narrow down what could cause the bug to occur. They try to get a minimal reproduction test case. This makes both fixing the error easier, but also easier to test it later to prove that it's been fixed. And even once you can creatively think about tests and can problem solve efficiently, there's still something missing. So you can think of a testing mindset in two opposing halves. The first half is testing for things that you already know. So if I do this thing, I expect this result. And this is where problem solving and creativity thrive. The second half is testing for things you don't yet know. And this requires exploration and experimentation. It needs a curious mind to think, I wonder what would happen if I do this. And this is often called exploratory testing where testers try different things to see what happened and then pursue interesting behaviors looking for what could be an error or a bug. But that doesn't mean it's completely ad hoc or spur of the moment. It can be planned. When I was at Puppet, we were working on a new Puppet module and one of the testers would hold an exploratory testing session for us, the developers. The tester would give each developer one or two scenarios to cover. And these scenarios were deliberately vague and gave us a lot of latitude to do different things. Now, I was new to the team at that time, so I was given the scenario of follow the examples in the README documentation. So as I was new, I didn't have the same background as the other developers, so I would then try and explore different aspects of the Puppet module because they may not have considered them. It's also important for new users that the README actually makes sense and can be followed. So not only was I doing exploratory testing, but I was making sure the documentation was correct. And as a developer, it actually gave me a much better appreciation of the software that I was writing. So what would it look like if I applied this to a PowerShell script? So Michael Lombardi did a great talk at PowerShell Summit 2019 called Doctor, Don't Defenestrate, What to Do About Legacy Code, which is about the process of taking legacy code and making it more manageable. In essence, he was taking low quality PowerShell and trying to make it into good quality PowerShell. And he did this by applying a testing mindset. This was his approach. He first tried to make sense of the PowerShell script and then document what he found. He then formalized the current behavior of the script and then iteratively approved on the script through refactoring. So how does all that relate to a testing mindset then? 
Well, steps one and two actually used exploratory testing to figure out how the PowerShell worked. Now, mostly this was actually just looking at the PowerShell and thinking through the workflow in his head. But it did also include running the script in a safe way to see how it would behave and then document that behavior. Step three there used a testing technique called characterization tests to document the behavior. And these were automated software tests using PESTA. Then step four, he applied some creative thinking to refactor the PowerShell to make it better to maintain. And then in step five, he knew he couldn't change everything at once because it was too big a change. So he applied some problem solving to improve the script iteratively and be sure he wasn't breaking how the script would work. So each part of that process applied a different aspect of the testing mindset, taking the PowerShell script from legacy to manageable and high quality. But that's a lot to remember. So I'm going to leave you with, hopefully, something a bit simpler to recall. Something from renowned archaeologist Indiana Jones. And he said, Archaeology is a search for fact, not truth. If it's truth you're interested in, Dr. Tyree's philosophy class is right down the hall. Now, people normally think that software testing is a bit like archaeology. They're poring over old code, looking for facts about it. But really, it's much closer to philosophy. We are searching for truth about our PowerShell scripts. In fact, software testing is really just applied epistemology, which is the study of how do you know what you know? And this goes way back, back to the days of Socrates in 400 BC. So what happens when we apply this kind of old philosophy to PowerShell? Well, we end up with two very important questions which our testing mindset seeks to answer. Does my PowerShell do what it should? And how do I know my PowerShell does what it should? When you can answer those two easy to remember questions, you're well on your way to applying a testing mindset to PowerShell. Thank you. Hi guys, my name is Jérôme Bézé-Torres. I live from France in Lyon. I'm Microsoft Certified Trainer since 10 years. I'm Microsoft MDV for the first years. I'm also VMware vXper. You can find my reference, like my blog, my Twitter account, and my email. I'm a French author from France. I'm published a book in French uh, at uh, any edition with Damien Van Robey, like MVP, we, we write a book around PowerShell and WPF. This book is available in France and on Amazon. And now the English version will arrive. We can have the same resources, but in English and with some updates. Today we are focus on TrueNAS. What is TrueNAS? TrueNAS is an open source solution based on FreeBSD. Today we are focused on storage. Storage for my VMware lab and for enterprise. TrueNAS and is API. TrueNAS have a REST API. We can use TrueNAS with the PowerShell invoke REST method, and you can find all the doc for your TrueNAS with the URL. You can find two API, one RESTful and one WebSocket. For this thing, I create a TrueNAS PowerShell module, Power TrueNAS. It will be available on my GitHub repository available on PowerShell gallery. The module is cross-platform. How to set up my de demonstration? We look to TrueNAS setup, a TrueNAS core, one disk for OS, seven disk for LUN, one NIC, and my VMware lab, VSphere set with free OXXI. In action, first, I need to interact with my PowerShell module with TrueNAS Core API to configure the storage. 
and then my script will program shell and program CLI to interact with my vSphere and then there is a relation between my tuna score and my vSphere set. Yes, now I need to import my proportional module. Here the description. I need to parkour my scripts and then I execute my script. I need to connect to my tuna score with HTTPS. I need to use script the certificate check because I have a own self sign certificate. I can list all disks on a news disk. I create my pool. I create my ZVOL volume. I can list all my volume, configure my ISKZ, configure my initiator, my target, my extent, my association of my target with my target ID and extent ID, and configure my ISKZ services. Here I can list Here there is all my function available in this version. Now I can connect to my server root with my password, very secure for lab only. Here we go. I'm connecting on my Tuna server with the latest, latest update on my VMware platform. I need to leave all my disk. I need to I need to create my pool. I need to create my Z volume on my data. Now I need to list my volume created. I need to find my Z vol four, three, two, and one. I need to configure my ISCSI. Cool. I need to configure my target. I need to configure my association and my extent. Here we go. My extent is good. My ZVOL data, ZVOL4. And now I need to make the association before my target and my extent. Cool. Now my ASCSI services is down. Here, I need to start it and I need to check my service is running. Now, if I open my Tuna scroll with my web brother on my pool, here we go. I find my pool storage file system and my ZVOL 1, 2, 3, and 4. If I look my iSCSI services, my portal, yes, Tuna, Tuna's my initiator, authorized access are not configured, all my target, my extent, and my associate target. If I look to my ISKZ, my ISKZ is already running. It not start automatically, but I need to make it, yes. Yes, now I need to configure my VMware vSphere. Yes, so now my vSphere server. I need to connect on all my server OSXI and configure some network storage, enable my HBA software iSCSI enable, and then I had my Freenas look for an address I I scale the HBA target, and then I make this for all my basic side. I'm connect. And I make some change. I need to rescan all my my function. I need to make 
is this? For all my server. I make wrong my password. Okay. It's good. And now I need to make what? I need to discover my SXI and my freelan. And here, here we go. I find my learn that I create on my OSXI, trend, my four Zvol. Now I need to I need to disconnect. And here I create all my learn on my OSXI. I create my fallen attached to my OSXI free. Now I need to connect to my vCenter and to verify. To verify on my OSXI one, here I have my all nested OSXI, my vCenter, and here I SCSI, my storage for the one. If you want to contribute to my GitHub project, you can find the link and my PowerShell module is available on PowerShell Gallery.